The following is neither a hoax nor a conspiracy. Do not adjust your computer, telephone, tablet, or television. We will be controlling all that you see and hear, and maybe even what you think. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the world of cognitive biases. In less than 20 years, the internet revolution has had a deeper impact on human behavior than all other media, so that today, it even affects the way we think. Imagined and invented stories, and even outright lies, have become prominent in our media landscape. How could this be? What underpins their popularity? Why is it that we've come to doubt expert testimony Could it be that our brains are predisposed towards compelling nonsense? When the World Wide Web was invented in the 1990s, it was imagined as a democratic space that would provide everyone direct access to all of human knowledge. Yet today, it seems knowledge is being eclipsed by conviction, and we are all at risk of being dragged down into a democracy of the gullible. There's now a competition between information providers, from professional journalists to anyone with a Facebook or Twitter profile, to capture our finite attention. I never look at Twitter and never comment on anything on Twitter or on Facebook. You keep hearing on TV about something going viral. When was the last time a YouTube comment changed someone's opinion? The internet has profoundly changed how we communicate, as well as the rules of disseminating information. The value of truth and facts has been diminished. Online, opinions are ranked according to engagement, so that a much-liked Facebook post can be more prominent than an encyclopedia entry. How popular content is, because that determines whether it can reach and attempt to convince me, is going to become more important. The likelihood of capturing people's attention is increased if you shape your content to follow the direction of the brain's natural biases. The internet today is full of manipulation, beliefs and superstitions. And the key culprit is not Google, Facebook or even the Illuminati but our very own brains. Our minds sometimes lead us away from objective reality. They allow a number of shortcuts, deviations from rationality, that serve as entry points to so-called cognitive biases. These biases act on the way we think, a bit like how an optical illusion fools the eye. But recognizing our little intellectual lapses is as difficult for us as it would be for a person who was born blind to understand an optical illusion. Take this checkerboard. Boxes A and B are exactly the same shade of gray, but even when the illusion is revealed, we continue to feel there is some kind of trick. We can see just how powerful these effects are in magic. Magicians are masters in manipulating cognitive biases. If we removed all biases, it would be very difficult to make magic come to life. It probably wouldn't be perceived as magic, but as special effects. The true emotion we feel, the sense of wonder we have watching magic, I'm not sure there would be any of that left without our inherent biases. Magician Luc Langevin creates illusions that seem to defy the laws of physics. He does so also by exploiting our natural inclination to believe. I think over time, the human brain created certain shortcuts that enable us to be more efficient, but which also lead to errors of perception. Cognitive biases may make us more efficient in everyday life, but they explode online. Here, our natural weaknesses are exploited. 
In his book, The Democracy of the Gullible, Gérard Brunner, a well-known sociologist from the Paris Diderot University, has dissected the various biases in our brains that influence our judgment on the internet, starting with doubt. Doubt is fundamental, especially in democracies. People have a fundamental right to doubt things, from official communications to scientific proposals. But as Othello painfully learned, the seeds of doubt can be easily planted, sometimes just for the sake of doing so. If the right to doubt is not accompanied by due diligence, it's a real threat to democracy. On the internet, doubt is amplified by countless untrustworthy sources. And although there are tools to check the truth of posts, few people make that effort. For example, you don't a priori believe that a man never walked on the moon. You probably saw it on TV and so forth. But by utilizing doubt, we can tell you a story that will lead you step by step to a conclusion that seemed completely unlikely at first. The belief that Neil Armstrong never set foot on the moon is untenable. The USSR would have been delighted to denounce even the slightest deception. It was easy for them to aim their antennas towards the moon to confirm or refute the transmission. And for those who say a satellite could have broadcast the images from space, remember that in 1969, a 100 megabyte disk weighed a ton. The Saturn V rocket may have been able to transport the DVD into space, but would have had no room left for a player to play it on. In 2009 and 2012, evidence from Indian, Chinese, and American probes put an end to the rumors. If you were to doubt everything, you couldn't live. For example, you'd say, I know I'll burn my hand if I put it close to a fire because I've already done that. But what about my foot, my head? I haven't tried those yet. How cognitive biases and our emotions influence reasoning is a subject of great interest to Isabelle Blanchette. She's a professor at the University of Quebec at Trois-Rivières. Le doute nous permet Doubt allows us to reassess our beliefs, but at the same time, we don't abandon everything because of one example that contradicts what we believe. We have a tendency to caricaturize and categorize things that are actually more nuanced. We have an innate predisposition to attend to human faces. This is crucial for recognizing people. But this same bias can lead us to question facts and believe in the presence of, for example, an ancient civilization on Mars. Our brain is a sense-making machine, so it isn't surprising that we have difficulty accepting coincidence as an explanation. When we see a unicorn-shaped cloud in the sky, of course there's no unicorn there, but our brain superimposes that impression. And we see those types of cognitive processes often. If we asked a person whether they would use the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 on a lottery ticket, most would say no, because they'd feel they wouldn't win. We constantly encounter content that exploits our difficulties in understanding statistics and probabilities. Our dismissal of coincidence as explanation influences our preferences in the torrent of information. The deregulation of the information market charms some of our mind's natural slopes. For example, if you have one chance in a thousand of hitting the bullseye with a dart, it's only extraordinary if you hit it if you haven't tried a thousand times. The manipulation is to ignore the sample size, omit the 999 tries that failed, film the one that succeeded, and say, he's incredibly talented, isn't he? 
These days we are ceaselessly alerted to very low risks, and that has turned us into a society of hypochondriacs, something that may have been useful in the past, but is now cumbersome. For example, we have retained our craving for sugar, despite the consequences this has for our bodies. Such biases, inherited from our ancestors, are not defects per se. Long ago, certain biases were arguably extremely useful. Let's say you lived in a hostile environment. If you heard a rustling in the bushes, it would be better to overestimate the risk and run. Because if you don't, you might not be around long enough to tell the tale and pass on your genetic code. But in the jungle of the internet, overestimating risk can lead to troubling results. Conspiracists often think that when two events occur at the same time, it's not a coincidence. Correlation is not the same as causation, but if things are related, people see causality. Yves Jangras studied physics before specializing in the history of science. He's particularly interested in the evolution of critical thinking. Once something is online, destroying it is like killing a thousand-headed snake. It's an infinite task. There's a law that says, if it takes this much energy to create crap, it'll take 100 times more to destroy it. Hello. This law was formulated by Alberto Brandolini, an Italian programmer, in 2013. La quantità di energia necessaria a confutare una stronzata, chi produce, spreca, dedica le sue energie a cercare di controbatterle, purtroppo avrà una strada sempre in, in salita. Brandolini formulated this principle after observing Italy's former Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi lie on television without anyone being able to set the record straight. No, ma cosa c'entra? E come cosa c'entra? Ma gli interessi! E c'entra! This principle is used and abused by scammers, conspiracists, and a growing number of politicians. On a market where we say everyone has a right to speak, which is good, and everyone speaks the truth, which is another thing, our minds, including mine, will be tempted to accept that which resembles truth, even if it contradicts the actual truth. We have a mental tendency to accept the latest conspiracy theory, wave after wave. We might begin by being wary of palm oil, rightly or wrongly. That brings us to another site, which is about something entirely different, Israel's role in the terrorist attacks, for example. This aggregates into a multi-layered construct which is intimidating, even for those who do not believe it. In the early 2000s, we still hoped that the Internet would spread massive amounts of knowledge, but that hasn't happened at all. It's a funny type of democracy. It's what I call the democracy of the gullible. It's true the Internet is democratizing because it gives everyone access to public space, but while some vote a thousand times, others never vote at all, and often those who vote most carry the strongest and most radical convictions and beliefs. We generally associate with those who think like us and view those who don't as fools. If someone thinks like us often, we tend to believe they're intelligent, that they're someone it would be nice to have coffee with. This is exactly what's happening on the Internet, except much worse. As opinions are polarized into opposing camps, diversity of viewpoints and nuances disappear. Small, highly motivated groups often attract so many clicks that their positions appear to be much more representative than they really are. There's a tyranny of minorities who are louder than others. Unfortunately, tyrannies know how to exploit the apathy of good, reasonable people. It's astonishing how conspiracy theories use highly technical arguments in a wide variety of fields. You accumulate arguments that have nothing to do with each other and which are all quite weak, 
But bundled together, the unprepared mind thinks they can't all be false. That's why conspiracy theories or the anti-vaccine movement have such persuasive power. It's not that people believe each and every argument, but there are so many of them. Mental shortcuts help our brains save energy, but they also lead to biases such as the least effort principle, which make us easier targets. Rumors and conspiracy theories have existed for a long time in human imagination. Rehashing is an internet speciality. Since old fake news is quickly forgotten, it can be used again as fresh news a few months later. Unlike us, the internet never forgets. In a sense, the internet has transformed an oral tradition into a written one. And with the copy-paste function, it's easy to distribute silly nonsense. It's like a dialogue of the deaf when a small group, like the 9-11 truthers, still believes the fall of the Twin Towers was a government conspiracy. The belief that it's impossible for an inexperienced pilot to fly a Boeing with control because a video gamer failed to do so is far from reality. Once in the air, flying is almost child's play. You could train a chimpanzee to do it. Furthermore, no one had ever seen an aircraft crash at full speed into one of the most solid buildings ever built, the Pentagon. It's pointless to argue with those who believe in conspiracy theories, such as that the American government is hiding aliens. The mainstream media shouldn't feed off Twitter, but report only legitimate news and not engage with things that are pure delirium. Oh, shit! Oh. The least effort principle might be seen as the father of all biases. Being lazy can be useful, and we can all be a bit gullible. We don't have the power to completely disconnect from our prior knowledge, expectations, hopes and emotions. Thus, we are almost always biased when we process information, which isn't necessarily bad. It serves a function. It reduces the difficulty of processing our environment. There are two ways to accomplish a reasoning task. One is more intuitive, automatic and faster, and demands less cognitive juice. The other exercises reasoning and reflection and requires more cognitive resources. There's a great article saying that 70% of Internet users only read headlines, and to prove it, the body was in placeholder text. Many people shared it, saying 70% of Internet users only read headlines. This kind of reduction in effort is frightening. Our brains are lazy. In general, we go through everyday life in belief mode. And belief mode has advantages over knowledge, because it doesn't require much effort. We just believe. The belief about chemtrails imagines a conspiracy whereby the American government and the pharmaceutical industry use airlines to spread toxic substances to poison people and influence world affairs. The main suspects are human-reptile hybrids or Illuminati. There are many erroneous beliefs that don't have any knock-on effects. People believe the sun moves around the earth. It's what they see every day. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. The scientific truth here is abstract. Let's not worry about such inconsequential beliefs. We should focus on those beliefs that have consequences. If a group wants to change the law because they believe in chemtrails, that's something we should deal with. Everyone has opinions. I always say Twitter and Facebook are really just bar talk, but on a global scale. In the past, bar talk always stayed at the bar, whereas now our nonsense is put on Twitter and broadcast to the world.
Even the most intelligent person in the world could still be fooled by a magician because that person does not have access to all the information the magician has, which can lead to the impression of prescience or teleportation or the spontaneous appearance of an object. There's always a trick. I'm convinced that even Albert Einstein could have been taken in by magic. We know there's a trick, but we like to forget while watching. Unlike the Internet, we do not have unlimited resources. The principle of least effort makes us accept easy explanations. We only see what we want to see, and we adopt the majority view. When we invent a magic trick, we create those conditions. Ultimately, we fool the brain and make it draw false conclusions. The fact that our default is to rely on more automatic cognitive processes allows the Internet to make use of anything that is likely to deceive. The spread of computer viruses and online scams are good examples, as these largely play on our instinctive biases. It takes a similar skill set to plan a bank robbery as to come up with a trick that puts a cell phone inside a bottle. In computer science, a virus is generally a program designed to act maliciously on a computer. When access is restricted, USB keys are left in parking lots, and often people pick them up, take them inside, and plug them into their system. Sending emails works as well. That has quite a low success rate, maybe one person in a thousand. But that's enough, because you only need one. Magic is often associated with scams because we use similar tactics. The simplest advice, which sadly is seldom followed, is to carry out updates. The least effort principle is a boon for scam artists. We rarely change default settings and often use predictable passwords. I don't think anyone is 100% protected. We all have subconscious prejudices. We all have things we believe or want to believe. Any one of us can be fooled by a scammer who pulls the right strings and appears at the right moment. Computer experts have more information than most of us. We sometimes forget that storing data in the cloud actually means sending it to massive data centers. There are many, many websites that talk about chemtrails, the Loch Ness Monster and such. Let's consider how many sites Internet users may visit to learn about a subject. Most won't look at more than 30. So if we take the top 30 sites listed on Google search, and look at how many support a particular belief, how many argue it out from a rational point of view, and how many are neutral, we find that 70% of those sites will support a belief. Cognitive biases help us tame our fear of the unknown. We have a tendency to adopt the first belief that fills a void. When you ask someone whether they're superstitious, most will say no. It's been shown that superstition is related to uncertain situations. Our brain is trying to control our environment. That's probably one reason why we've survived this well. To make sense out of a disturbing event, people in situations where they are losing or have lost control will more easily rely on beliefs, superstitions and conspiracies. In everyday life, the feeling of losing control often translates into acts such as touching wood for luck, consulting horoscopes, or exploring new beliefs. Martine Dragon is the owner of a specialized boutique in Quebec that serves an ever-growing demand. We all have events we cannot control in our lives. I believe that when we are more balanced, it's easier to navigate these moments. I don't think the route is so important, but rather the direction. Our superstitions have long roots. Two millennia after Ptolemy, 
no one has updated the zodiac, although the constellations have moved on. Most people who believe they were born under the sign of Virgo, for example, probably weren't. To be able to judge value, we generally need to have something else to compare it to. So if there is an object being sold for 20, although it's normally worth 40, a normal brain will feel this is a good deal, right? This we can call an anchor bias. According to the anchor bias, we rely heavily on the first piece of information we receive. This goes beyond economics. Professor of Cognitive Sciences Andrew Stolman is especially interested in intuitive theories. As children, we tend to form our own theories about the world that are meant to explain everyday events around us but aren't necessarily accurate. They don't necessarily comply with the scientific view of the world. But these intuitive ideas never go away. They're just suppressed. And if a person is burdened, under time pressure, or has a lot on their mind, this intuitive understanding re-emerges. It took us a lot longer to say that a plant was alive than to say an animal was alive because plants don't move. So our earliest understanding of alive just meant something that can move on its own. With the anchor bias and the confirmation bias, we have developed a series of automatic responses that make us more efficient as we go through daily life. One analogy would be when we are visiting a country which has a very different culture to our own. We can feel that. We experience cognitive fatigue because we are constantly having to learn. As such, our expectations and our knowledge are very useful in enabling us to function on a daily basis. Cognitive laziness does not necessarily translate to lack of energy. On the contrary, believers often increase their efforts to solidify their belief. True believers are more motivated than the average citizen, and because they are more driven, they occupy the spaces left empty in the deregulated information market. Empty chairs in this market aren't good. That produces a terrible effect. This tyranny of minorities can convince people who are undecided to side with them. Another powerful effect online is conformity. Conformity is an active part of confirmation bias. Members of a homogenous group will ruthlessly reject any element that does not conform to their collective belief. We internet. Yes, the internet is extraordinary, but we must be able to train people so that in the future they can read the internet. I do the bending utensils trick often because I know that some people think it really is possible. It's in our collective imagination because of everything that happened around Uri Geller, because of what they've seen in films. It allows them to dream. Believing in fantasies helps us to fill cognitive voids and may make us feel like we're privy to a secret, like we're one of the initiated. A good example is the discussion surrounding the many theories about how ancient monuments were built. Two times the base of the Great Pyramid of Giza divided by its height gives roughly pi, so 3.14. Dividing the large circle around the base by the small circle within gives the speed of light. And then there's the golden ratio. One wonders who designed these. Of all age groups, the ones who get most of their information online are younger people. And they're also the most likely to believe what they read online. I couldn't imagine my life without the internet, that's for sure. Books are good, but Wikipedia is like unlimited books. Facebook, Twitter and Snapchat give me a buzz. Most of the information on Facebook isn't necessarily credible. Young people don't come here to buy magazines. They buy no more magazines, no more newspapers, no more anything. There are a few who are my age or 10 years younger, around 40. But younger than that, no. The kiosk proportions have a factor of 2.64755, that of the pyramid. Squared, this gives us 7, the number of virginity we find pi again and the speed of light. So, who designed this mysterious kiosk in Paris?
Our cognitive biases help us filter input to avoid cognitive overload. These mental watchdogs are not so much censures as they are navigators. But on the internet, any manner of filtering is quickly seen as control, propaganda, and concealment. This information market was once regulated by gatekeepers, by guardians of the threshold, which is to say journalists, politicians, academics, and a whole series of people who were trusted to disseminate information in public spaces. With the Internet, anyone can express their opinions to the world directly, and that's good. In the Nixon era, we were lucky that there were honest players within a society of the spectacle. Today, there isn't even a spectacle. Today, it's a society of ads about a spectacle. Any journalist, academic or writer who has tried to expose or criticize these things at any given moment found themselves immediately accused of being part of a conspiracy. When things go viral, we rarely check their content against expert testimony before believing it. Our cognitive biases discourage us from investing the time and effort. In the past, when we opened a book, we knew that someone had taken the trouble to write it, edit it, and to get it published. It was a fastidious process. Posting on social networks is something you can do with one hand on your smartphone on a bus. The first battle, the battle for attention, has been won. We're in an attention economy where the amount of brain time you can bring to your site is monetized. Information available has greatly increased since the early 2000s. Les informations disponibles depuis, c'est disons depuis le début des années 2000. And you know what they say about men with small hands? You have to speak very loudly, and one way of speaking loudly in the information economy is to make outrageous statements. Although the Second Amendment people, maybe there is, I don't know. But... The deregulated information market also means tension, radicalized discourse, and the uncomfortable feeling of living in a society where everyone is shouting. It's clear that political debates in the U.S., but not only in the U.S., tend towards hysteria. Nothing weakens democracies better than playing on public opinion and, for instance, disseminating accusations about a politician's sex life or secret photos. Even if these aren't published, the damage is done. Political fights seem to have become battles for attention more than for conviction. You can fool people also for political ends. I think the intellectual process is unfortunately very similar to misleading and deceiving people. Traditionally, journalists were the watchdogs of democracies. But can they hold on to this role in a virtual world? And if not, who will replace them? Anonymous, we're not criminals or thugs, we are, well, romantics, just human beings, idealists, who want to see a better future. Romain Goulien is a young computer entrepreneur and a proud member of Anonymous, a movement striving to reclaim freedom of expression in the Internet era. He agreed to be interviewed without a mask. Saying that you don't need your communications to be private because you're not a criminal is similar to saying you don't need freedom of speech because you have nothing to say. Anonymous is a name. Anyone can call themselves anonymous. You can't really tell whether they're good or evil. The dark web is a place mainly used to find codes for hacking or for email viruses. It's not a crime to have values. The dark web is an attempt to regain independence and freedom of communication between humans. 
sur Russia Today. RT, the international Russian TV network financed by the Kremlin, posts all sorts of conspiracy theories originating in very ideological circles. Russia Today has proof that journalism... RT has often shown journalism that wins awards. And that maybe proves that the truth is not necessarily to be found in mainstream media. We distrust the media, the press, or even scientific experts on certain issues. Politically motivated misinformation and disinformation further amplify feelings of mistrust and insecurity. It's like a hobby. If someone is passionate about collecting champagne corks, they can devote hours and hours to it. I believe that here we are dealing with people who've gone crazy about their hobby. Critiquer les théories du complot n'est pas du tout Criticizing conspiracy theories doesn't mean that they don't exist. But when we do, it arouses extraordinarily violent reactions that will go from insults and name-calling to intimidation to actual threats. Conversing with people you don't know online, who often use pseudonyms, amplifies the violence of these exchanges. It doesn't take long before you compare the other to Hitler or a Nazi. When Charlie Hebdo was attacked in France, conspiracy theories were online just hours later. On January 7th, on the day of the attack, I logged more than 20 different conspiracy theories. Four days later, there were already more than 100. People who feel as if their integrity was attacked will also feel their fundamental belief that the world is a safe place has been shaken. Disinformation can maintain a state of denial. It gives us the impression that we have regained a certain amount of control, whilst allowing us to keep our faith in our strongest convictions. If we listen to the media, we end up hating ourselves as Muslims and each other. I prefer to believe in conspiracy theories. I found sources, but I can't cite them. I'm a Muslim, and I don't want to believe those people can kill in the name of God. The terrorists have a psychological intuition about what their actions provoke in people. This kind of terror shakes the fundamental belief that one needs to have to live in our societies, the confidence that our lives will not be menaced every day. The loss of control bias can have a direct impact on other types of beliefs, such as on the belief in conspiracies. By conforming, you can give in to an idea and feel that it has always been your truth, a bit like a revelation. Conspiracy theories can be consoling. I don't like this reality, so I'll find another and flee. We don't have a truth problem, it's a trust problem. To paraphrase Brandolini's law, it takes a thousand times more effort to re-establish trust than to shake it. Instant access to all of human knowledge has paradoxically brought us to a place where we are devoting less and less time to being well informed, and fewer people are paying heed to scientific fact. We all have cell phones, but few people really understand how they work. It's a bit like magic. Mixing up serious facts with crazy information to excite certain natural tendencies in our minds. We say, what's this story about giants? They've discovered skeletons. Even if we don't believe it, we want to see the fake photos. We must be wary of what we call the authority or white coat effect. You appear on TV in a white lab coat, and all of a sudden you have more authority. If it comes from a site no one has heard of, ask yourself, are other sites talking about this? If it's unbelievable, spectacular news, and just one site is talking about it, it's suspicious. If you state that there's a Limoges teapot orbiting Mars or Pluto, well then it's up to you to prove it. It's not for me to say, no, there's not. 
I can't prove that it doesn't exist. However, those adept at conspiracy theories leave it to others to refute their beliefs. Planting doubt is enough for them. The belief that humans could have rubbed shoulders with dinosaurs is easier to swallow than the fact that mice and elephants have a common ancestor. The creationist movement uses this belief to joyfully discredit the evolution of the species. Some creationists have made it into universities and swear in the name of science that badly photoshopped photos of storks could be pterodactyls. To hell with science. Films and cartoons love the idea of rubbing shoulders with dinosaurs. As soon as there's a division of knowledge, I have to trust my colleagues. Otherwise, I'd have to always repeat every experiment, which is impossible. I think we need to recognize differences and constantly distinguish. We need to re-establish hierarchies where there is a tendency to level all sources of information onto the same plane. This information market revolution has to be accompanied by an education revolution to develop truly critical minds. We all have cognitive biases. They are present within us, no matter how intelligent or educated we are. You cannot extinguish the part of our brains that loves to discover things, that is curious and loves to grow. I know it exists. Perhaps the internet paradox is just a pendulum effect between knowledge and belief. There are young people who are creatively reinventing networks of qualitatively valuable knowledge. But for now, with our cognitive biases, only the vigor of our critical minds can protect us from the trap of the democracy of the gullible. <laughs>